This is our course in Systematic Theology 2. Today, as I said, I'm going to do a brief reintroduction to Systematic Theology, what it is, as a reminder for those of you who, who were here last term and as an introduction to those who weren't. Um, and then we're going to spend most of today's time talking about a subject that I skipped over last term, which is the providence of God. There's two reasons why I skipped over last term. It's because I had begun, I had paired it with something else that I knew was going to take pretty much the whole time. But also because the providence of God is closely related to the issue of human sin and salvation, the, the issue of election or predestination. And while we're not going to, those two things are gonna, not going to be immediately juxtaposed, I did not feel I should preach or teach. <laughs> providence in one term and then wait, you know, till the next term to deal with the rest of that. We'll at least deal with them within a few weeks of each other, okay? Um, next week we will talk about the doctrine of humanity, and then the week, the, court, the class would be April 18th. We are not meeting, that's Good Friday. So we will not meet in two weeks because it's Holy Good Friday. Then uh, April 25th, we will deal with the doctrines of sin and redemption. That's where we'll get into some of the election issues. May 2nd, we will talk about the doctrines of sanctification and glorification. Sanctification is to be made holy. Right? Um, May 9th, we will have no class because Carolyn and I are going to be out of the country. So, this is kind of cool this term because we have two classes and then a week off, and two classes and then a week off, and then three <laughs> classes. Uh, come back on the 16th for the doctrine of the church, 23rd, doctrines of the sacraments and gifts of the Holy Spirit, and May 30th, the doctrine of the future and the final exam. I will, as always, make an effort to have for you by the, the uh, fifth week, that is the week of May 16th, the What You Need to Know from Systematic Theology 2 paper, so you can be studying that. Okay, is that all clear? Yes. Don't forget, Holy Week, Good Friday, we don't meet, and the week, um, well, the, the date, May 9th, we do not meet in this class. Well, none of the classes meet that week, but, right? Good. Um, I shared this, this with you before. Uh, it's one of my favorite little cartoons. It's from the Gospel According to Peanuts. Lucy and Linus are at the window. Boy, Lucy says, look at the rain. It looks, um, what if it floods the whole world? And Linus says, it will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah he would ne that would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is the rainbow. Lucy says, you've taken a great load off my mind. And Linus says, sound theology has a way of doing that. <laughs> we are all, as Christians, called to be theologians. Now, um, what does that mean, that we are called to be theologians? It really is part of our responsibility as Christians to be theologians. So what is theology? Theology, in the general sense, means the study of God. Duh. What? That's why we're all called to be theologians, because we're all obligated as Christians, as servants, as children of God, to study Him. From the Greek words theo for God and logos for study, Christian theology especially. I mean, there is Hindu theology and Buddhist theology, etc., Christian theology is the study and effort to understand God as he has revealed himself in the scripture. That is, our Bible, the Old and New Testament. So that's the general definition of theology. Biblical theology, which we've had classes on biblical theology here, our New Testament theology and Old Testament theology were a biblical theology approach. And I will tell you, the difference in different kinds of theology is not in the conclusions they draw, but in the place where they start. You've heard me say that before. Biblical theology, for instance, starts with the Bible, with what it says. It doesn't start with questions or categories or, or anything else. It says, well, what does the Gospel of John say? And what, what do we know theologically from that? You know, what do the writings of Paul say? So, biblical theology is the study of doctrines found in the Bible, arranged according to their chronological and or historic background, like the theology of the Pentateuch, or theology of John's writings, or theology of Paul, etc., or theology of Revelation. But it's all based and oriented in the Bible. That doesn't mean you don't use the Bible as the source for other theologies, but it's where you start. Dogmatic theology, well, let's do systematic theology first. Um, <laughs> systematic theology, which is what we're studying, is the division of theological doctrines by systematic categories or groupings to better understand their final meanings and relevance, like a theology of angels or salvation. In other words, instead of picking up the Bible and saying, what's in here? You say, I wonder what we can know about God, or about the church, or about the future. You start with a category, and then you go to the Bible, 
to see what it says about those things. And you collect all the things, if it's the doctrine of God you're talking about, or the theology of God, all the things the Bible tells you about God, which is a lot. And then you have dogmatic theology, which is a form of systematic theology, but it's used to articulate and defend the theological doctrines of a particular organized religious body, like Roman Catholic dogma, Presbyterian dogma, etc. Right? In other words, they start with the dogmas, with the doctrines. In the Catholic Church, they have some dogmas, some doctrines that we as Protestants don't have. For instance, doctrine of the Virgin Mary. And there's a whole theology, or whole Mariology, there's a name for it, around what they believe about Mary as being a, a person to whom they owe particular reverence. As Protestants, we don't give Mary enough reverence. You know, but uh, it's the, it, So they start with the categories of doctrines that they have. Those are the, the kinds of theologies that we're oriented. And of course, we're dealing with the last one here, systematic theology. And the definition, this is slightly expanded from what I just read. Systematic theology is the division of theological doctrines into systematic categories or groupings, the subsequent study of those systematic categories in order to better understand their final meaning and relevance for today as revealed in Scripture. Our source for what we believe in systematic theology, as in biblical theology, is the Bible. But we start with categories and then fill in those categories from what we find in the Bible. Is that clear? Those different kinds of theologies? We're okay with that? Okay. Now let's try. I think it's malaria. Okay. So, theology is always, has been called the queen of sciences. It's the overarching standard that should tie all other pursuits of human advancement together. Historically, that's been the case. Not so much in the last 200 years, but historically, theology was seen as the thing that ties the whole the rest of it together, all the rest of human understanding and experience. And it's a science because science is a distinct, systematized, systematic theology, remember, systematized field of knowledge and an object of study. That's Webster's encyclopedia, or dictionary. So science and philosophy, apart from religion, seek the I-it truth that leads to knowledge by using reason and senses. How I relate to the material world, how I relate to the, phys you know, the physical nature of things. That's science. Theology is concerned with a personal relationship, not a relationship with the inanimate. It's the I-thou truth that leads to faith. And that exists by revelation, meaning what has been revealed to us by God, as well as our use of reason and the senses. And so while theology is the queen of sciences and fits the definition of a science, it's not a natural science. But it is, I give you this sort of three-minute overview for you, to, for you to understand that theology in a historical sense has very much been perceived as an academic discipline alongside of uh, various other disciplines like the natural sciences. And in fact, theology is seen as the one who sort of ties it all together, is the overarching reality. One of the things I think is a mistake we make today, if theology is to have the needed impact on the world, it needs to affirm reason and sense observation just as much as science and philosophy. Bless you. We use, we use reason and the senses in theology Plus revelation, there's the extra element of it. The failure to recognize the necessity of using reason and senses. A lot of the dumb Christians out there is one of the things that has given Christianity a bad name. We have a responsibility to use our brains, our sensibilities, our rationality, as well as dependence upon revelation. Okay? Or else we become the outliers. And we're not. We're supposed to be the one that ties it all together. We're supposed to be the center point as we represent the things of God. All right, now, uh, oh, there we go, just as science and philosophy do. Brief history of modern theology, the briefest history you're ever gonna hear. <laughs> Prior to the Reformation, that is, and the Reformation began 1517, which is when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Cathedral. Um, Prior to that, dogmatic theology was virtually all that existed, which means all theology was an effort by the Catholic Church to explain and defend its own doctrine, its own dogma. That's all there was. Then, 
The Reformation, one of the five solas, one of the five major emphasis of the Reformation was sola scriptura, meaning scripture alone as a basis of authority, not the magisterium of the church, not what the pope and the cardinals and the bishops and the priests say, that the ultimate authority is solely with scripture. And because of that um, emphasis on scripture, there was an explosion during and after the Reformation on scholarship and commentaries and research, translations and you know, searches for the earliest possible manuscripts in Scripture. So a huge emphasis after the 1517 on the Bible. In the 17th century, Protestant scholasticism, there had been a Catholic scholasticism as well, but Protestant scholasticism in the 17th century developed systematic theologies. These are huge, huge <coughs> systems of understanding about theological themes. And some of them got ridiculous. In fact, scholasticism developed a bad reputation with a lot of people because they'd spend enormous amounts of energy and writing and ink and paper arguing over how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. That's people, that's an illustration that's often used. It really was an argument. In fact, apparently, when the Ottoman Turks were actually beating down the doors of Constantinople, most of the people in the city that were of any importance who could have done anything to rally the troops were all together in Hagia Sophia arguing over how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. So this can be counterproductive if you let it be. That doesn't mean systematic theology is a bad idea, though. And then in the 17th and 18th century, we have the Enlightenment, the rise of rationalism, the belief that the human reason is the only ultimate source of knowledge and of truth, and therefore, it led us to a denial of the supernatural, including a denial of the idea that the Bible is a book given by God. So miracles don't exist. Jesus could not have been divine. No walking on water, no feeding the 5,000, no God speaking to us in this book. And everything changed. But that's relatively recent. Right? Even compared to the 2,000-year the, the history of the Christian faith. In 1787, Johann Philip Gabler, and I talked about this much more in the biblical theology classes, he took over as the head of systematics for a, a university and seminary in Germany, and in his, his opening address, he advocated a separation of biblical and systematic theology, which had all been sort of one thing before that. And as a result, he said biblical theology should be focused on history historical knowledge of what the scripture had historically meant. And that led to both the search for more ancient texts, it also led to a lot of higher criticism, questioning the veracity of scripture, all kinds of mess. Okay. Those Germans. <laughs> Where's Bob? Yeah. Oh, hi Bob. <laughs> but systematic theology was seen not so much as historical, but rather as doctrinal. It dealt with what scriptures mean now. Systematic theology was primarily the approach to learning in a systematic way what's, what our theology, theological beliefs are and then being able to teach them. It is a teaching model. So biblical theology after Gobbler in 1787 focused on what scriptures had meant historically in their context, who were their authors, what were they meaning. Systematic theology had to do with what does it mean to us now and how to teach it. All right? And again, another one of my favorite cartoons. I hear you're writing a book of theology. I hope you have a good title. And Snoopy says, I have the perfect title. Has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? <laughs> Whenever we do theology, especially at a higher level, systematic theology, for instance, we always have to have some humility. We are finite in our abilities, and never are we more finite than we talk about than when we talk about the providence of God, okay? um, which is our next topic. We want to get into the main meat of the thing today. Any questions about anything I've said so far in terms of a general introduction to systematic theology and what it is? We're good. Good. Okay. We gotta get this fixed. <laughs> drinking, drinking warm water is like, you know, being in your bed. I don't know. <laughs> you know that. I didn't know that. There. I didn't ask. <laughs> okay. Okay. The providence of God. Um, first, let's give a definition. What do we mean by the providence of God? Um, 
Providence of God mean, it refers to the means by and through which God maintains and governs all things in the universe. In other words, after the creation, after God made everything, what does He do with it? Providence is God maintaining and governing everything in His created universe. Another definition, and this one was from Burkauer. By the way, if you were ever to pick a second systematic theology book, I know you're just chomping at the bit to get more of this stuff. <laughs> then Burkauer's is considered the standard reformed uh, theology. And, and it's quite good. It's really not hard to read either. It's a little harder than Grudem, but it's also more correct than Grudem in some ways. So Burkauer defines it this way. That continued exercise of divine energy, whereby the Creator preserves his creatures, is operative in all that comes to pass in the world, and directs all things to their appointed end. He actually, when he says preserves his creatures, is operative in what comes to pass in the world, and directs all things to their appointed end, there's three pieces to that. We're going to talk about those three pieces, because there's three aspects, in a systematic theological sense, there's three aspects to God's providence, and we'll talk about that. And he identifies all three of them in, the, in that expression. Preserves his creatures, operative in all that comes to pass, and directs all things to their appointed end. When we talk about preservation, concurrence, and governance. And I'll explain that in a little while. Two other definitions that I'll give you that I don't have written down here are from two of the great catechisms. The Heidelberg Catechism, Lutheran, defines providence as this, the almighty and ever-present power of God, whereby he still upholds, as it were by his own hand, Heaven and earth, together with all creatures, and rules in such a way that leaves and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and unfruitful years, food and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, and everything else come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. And one more definition. This one is from the Westminster Confession. God, the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible foreknowledge, and the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. So now you have four different definitions. They all say the same thing. How God interacts and runs the world after he created it. That's what providence is. Now, um, this includes, God's providence includes his maintenance of the universe as a whole, Psalm 103, 19, the physical world, the affairs of nations, human birth and destiny, human success and failure, the protection of his people. This doctrine stands in direct opposition to the idea that the universe is governed by chance, which goes all the way back to the Greek uh, philosophy of Epicureanism, or by fate, stoicism, or that God simply started the process and then left, which is deism. We're going to talk about those a little bit as we go along. Now let me say right now, there is no topic within Christian theology that will get people sitting upright in their chairs and mad at each other faster than the issue of providence. James Montgomery, oh, James Montgomery Boyce, whose uh, book on Foundations of Christian Faith, it's actually three books, is really good. He said this, There is perhaps no point at which Christian doctrine comes more into conflict with contemporary worldviews than in the matter of God's providence. Most of what the world says about how the world works is not consistent with the Christian doctrine of providence. People, even evangelical Christians, frequently differ and often lack understanding about God's providence, and so they have a lot of heartburn over this stuff. And I want to tell you, as we get into this, some of you are going to disagree with what I'm going to be telling you. But, as you disagree with what you hear, and that's okay, you don't have to agree with everything I say, I want you to ask yourself a question, though, if you're having a problem with this. Why am I having trouble accepting this? You need to ask yourself, if I'm having trouble accepting this, and what I'm presenting to you is the traditional historic doctrine of providence. At least the oldest version of it, and I'll talk about the history next. But do you not like it because it doesn't feel right? Do you not like it because it's not what you were taught? 
Or do you not like it because you don't think that's what Scripture says? Because that's the only one that really matters. What does Scripture say? Our ultimate authority is what is in the Bible. And I'm going to give you about 10,000 verses today to tell you why I believe this is what God's providence is. Because that's the only true foundation on which we base our theology is what is in Scripture. Okay? All right. Um, now, historically, from the very earliest days, Christian theologies have always taken a position that God indeed does preserve and govern the world in an active, not a passive way. That God is active in the world, and the things that are occurring in the world are according to his active participation in the events of history. Now, all the way back to the 5th century, the first, the first serious articulation of this was Augustine. St. Augustine, he led the way in stressing that all things that occur... All things in nature, in the world, all events, are preserved and governed by the sovereign, wise, and beneficent will of God, including control over good and evil alike. I don't know why this thing is tailing off. I wasn't doing that before. God is running everything, and he is responsible in his goodness and his love for all things that happen, including the things that we call both good or evil. Half the verses I'm going to give you have to do with the fact that Scripture says God did things which were considered evil. That's one of the shocking things about this. Now, so Augustine is the first one to seriously articulate this, as he was many other things. You know, so many of our doctrines go back to Augustine, the 400s. Um, throughout ancient times and the Middle Ages, there has been virtually there was virtually no controversy about the doctrine of God's providence. All of the councils of the church, the nine ecumenical councils, and then many more that met that were either Eastern Orthodox or, or Catholic, none of them felt that this was an important enough issue in terms of any disagreement that they needed to address it. This was never been a controversy in the history of the church. The great, probably the greatest Catholic theologian, Thomas Aquinas, his doctrine of providence followed directly after Augustine's. He agreed with Augustine in everything. He held holding that the will of God, as determined by God's perfections, preserved and governs all things in the universe. Now again, what it means now, not at the point of creation. And then the Protestant reformers come along. Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, these guys. On the whole, they all agreed with the, uh, the Augustinian and the Aquinas doctrine of predestination, and, or of providence, I mean, they were all in agreement about that. There was no controversy up through the Reformation about the doctrine of providence. In fact, there was no dissension on this doctrine until the 16th century. And two groups at that point, the Socinians, which, I'm sorry, but they were Polish heretics. <laughs> Our Polish contingent down front here. Um, they, the Socinians were Arians, which means they didn't believe Jesus was, was equal to the Father. He was created being. They're Unitarians. They don't believe in the Trinity. They didn't believe Jesus was divine. They were heretics in a half dozen different ways. They, they questioned whether or not the historic and traditional view of God's providence was accurate. And then the Arminians. Jacob Arminius, who actually has a, his Dutch name is uh, uh, Herman Zoot. <laughs> um, Arminius is the Latinized version of it. He was a Calvinist theologian. In fact, when John Calvin, before he died, he appointed uh, Theodore Beza as his successor, as the head of the, the, the Calvinist movement, of the Reform movement. In, uh, and then Beza was the teacher of Jacob Arminius. Arminius, at one point, was asked to, um, to using scripture, to verify the... The, by that time, the sort of hyper-Calvinistic kind of uh, doctrine against somebody who was disagreeing with it, and when Arminius really got into this, he decided that he agreed with the guy who was being called a heretic more than he did with the hyper-Calvinistic ideas. And so his doctrine, the doctrine of providence and of predestination especially, and that's why people get heartburned about this, is because this directly leads into a discussion of election, of predestination, of who gets saved. So that's pretty high you know, heat content to that issue. Uh, Arminius began to say that human free will does affect God's providence. 
which was the first time they got seriously suggested, and this is in the 16th century, they ended up claiming that God's providence was limited by the independent power of man to control his own life, free will. And therefore, there are aspects that God does not maintain control over because we have the ability to control it. I'm not overstating that. That is what the doctrine of free will as interpreted by Arminius and the subsequent Arminians are. Uh, unfortunately, the response to Arminius' declarations was the Council of Dort. Dort. <laughs> In which, in, in the Netherlands, in which they came up with five point hyper Calvinism, which has been harming people ever since. I think John Calvin rolls over in his grave every time somebody says tulip, which is five point Calvinism total depravity, you know, unlimited atonement, etc., etc. I'm not going to get into the details of that, right now, but uh, it is a hyper interpretation of what Calvin said. And I'm going to quote a couple things from Calvin in a few minutes that will let you know that he was not nearly as harsh as people think he was. It's not Calvin that said the really harsh, ungenerous things related to his election. It's people who came after him. Right? Now, then, after that, the next major development in uh, the issue of God's providence was in the 18th and 19th centuries, the development of deism. Now, there was an aspect of deism that was much more ancient than that, but especially in the Americas, in the 18th and 19th century, deism came along that presented God as having withdrawn from the world after he created it. He made the world, and then he went on vacation and didn't leave a forwarding number. That's deism. Either that or some aspects of deism say God was not really a personality, he was just an evolutionary force. And so you can't communicate, either way, you can't communicate with him. And he is not involved anymore in the creation. That view then developed. Deism doesn't really exist per se anymore. I mean, I'm sure somebody believes it, but not anybody of significance. And yet it evolved into the modern idea about a world that is controlled only by natural law. That deism sort of evolved into that. There is no, in other words, there is no creator any longer involved in running the world. It's all just natural laws. That is the source from which we get evolution and scientism. Scientism is not a statement against science. Scientism is the belief that there are natural science explanations for everything devoid of any religious belief, that you can't have faith, you can't have belief, it has to be evidential science, and that that's the only source of truth. That's scientism. That is the dominant model that most people go under today, including people who think they're evangelical Christians, who still find themselves driven by that way of thinking. That, well, God started it all, he set it up, he created the natural laws, and then everything that happens, good and evil, is just a, is a development of that. Folks, that's not Christianity. Not by any historical understanding, not by what Scripture says, and I'm going to talk about that. Okay? And yet that is a... Eleven of you in this room believe that for us before today. Okay? I made that number up. But... <laughs> all right. Now, I want, to, I want to get into this. Any questions about that so far? Sort of the definition and historical background of the evolving of this. And I haven't even gotten into a lot of what this means yet. The first thing I want to do is to tell you that some aspects of the providence of God. Christian theism, that is Christian theology. Theism is a way of saying the Christian belief system, whatever flavor of it you're part of if, you, if you're Christian, has always stressed a twofold distinction regarding creation and providence. And the confusion between creation and providence is one of, the, one of the difficulties. Particularly, a lot of New Agey people today are pantheists. And they don't even, many don't even know what that word means. We'll talk about that. But the twofold distinction is first, creation, the making of everything by God, is called into existence, um, it's calling into existence things that did not previously exist. That's creation ex nihilo, from nothing. That is the Christian and Jewish belief about how creation happened. God didn't find a bunch of mud out there in space and then reform it into what we have. There was nothing other than God himself before the creation. However, providence continues. Creation happened. Providence continues and causes to continue what had been called into existence. So it's like a two-phase process. God created it, and then he runs it, which is called his providence. And there is a distinction in how second causes, that's us, can be involved 
in those two things. There can be no cooperation by creatures, us, the created beings, with God in the act of creation. We cannot have anything to do with creation next to hello. That's entirely a God thing. We weren't there. We didn't add anything. The most we can ever do in terms of the grading process is move stuff around so it looks prettier to us. Whether it's redecorating your house or painting a painting or doing a sculpture or putting on makeup. Right? We cannot create. But there is an aspect of cooperation and participation of the creature, that's us, with the creator in the continuation of God's providence. We do, in ways that, off, that, in, that are primarily mysterious, we do participate with God in the, in the uh, unfolding of his providential will. The, and that's called the cooperation of second causes with the first cause. God is called the first cause, or the prime mover. He's the one that started it, the first cause. Talking about cause and effect, every effect is ultimately traced back to the first cause. But there are second causes, meaning us. God made us, and then he involves us some in the manifesting of his will. The question is, how does he do that? Nobody has a problem when talking about human beings, second causes, participating with God about good stuff. Or when we participate with God in obedience. Everybody's cool with all that. But what about when evil things happen? Or what about when we are disobedient to God? How is it that God's will, when it's being disobeyed, how is it that those who are doing the disobeying are actually participating as a second cause to God's will as first cause? And how do you talk about all the unregenerate people, the people who don't acknowledge God, don't believe in Him, and all of their actions? How does that fit in with the first cause's providence and how He's running the world? Are we just telling God to, you know, blow it out your ear? We're going to do it our way, and do we have the power to do that? Really? What does that tell us about what we believe about God? This is where you get into some of the sticky questions about providence. Nobody has a problem when we're talking about obeying God and fulfilling His will, or when we're talking about doing good, because God is a good God, that all works. But what about when evil happens, or when we do evil? Or when people refuse to acknowledge God and try to go their own way. How does all that fit with the providential will of an all-powerful God? Right? Yes. Now, I'm going to jump into four errors that often are made with, relate, with regard to the providence of God. And these are primarily, and I'm, I'll give you the statement about the error, and then I'll kind of give you an explanatory phrase, like cooperation of second cause and first cause to help you understand what we're talking about. And then I'm going to come around and talk about Scripture and what it says, and why the historic Orthodox Christian faith, which was consistent all the way up to Jacob Arminius in the 16th century, why it has maintained what it has maintained. All right? And you'll stop me if you have any questions. I know you have questions, you're just not willing to stop me yet. <laughs> Errors related to the providence of God. I'm going to give you four of the major ones. First one is mistaking the continued providential activity of God in the world with mere foreknowledge or foreordination. This is a common mistake. In fact, this is the primary mistake of Arminianism, I believe. In other words, God knows what will happen, but he doesn't actually make it happen. That God, we sort of give a nod toward God's being omniscient and, and um, you know, omnipowerful by saying, well, he knows what's going to happen, but we don't believe he actually is involved in when it happens. All right? That is, to a great extent, the interpretation. Like when we start talking about election, people will say, well, you know, I don't think God chooses who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. He just knows who's going to choose him. That's not Orthodox Christian doctrine. Not in any historical sense. The providence of God says God is actively involved in everything, not just knows it. Okay? Your heart rate's getting a little faster now. Isn't it? Yeah. You have a little more heartburn about this. The second error that often occurs is the deistic belief against deism. The deistic belief that God's concern for the world is not universal or special or ongoing, but rather is only of a general nature, providing only general direction. 
This suggests that at the creation, God imparted certain properties and laws. He created the natural laws. And then he left creation to work out its destiny within those parameters, but with at most only general oversight. And particularly that God only is overseeing the maintenance of the natural laws, but that he is not concerned about the particulars. He's not concerned about specific cases, just the general stuff. In other words, the world is simply a machine that God put, it, God put into motion and then he left. He's on vacation for a virus, no forward. That is a deistic idea, but it is very common today. Well, stuff happens. That's the doctrine of deism. In two words sense, stuff happens. Well, where is God when stuff happens, is the question. A lot of people believe that. And there, there are serious, when I get to number four, it relates to this, and I'll, and I'll give you a, a specific reason why you don't really believe that, even if you thought you did. Number three, the pantheistic idea, pantheism, is the belief that everything in the world added together is God. That God is the created universe. Same thing. This is an Eastern religion belief, and it's very much popularized in the world today. You'll hear somebody say, I believe in the God who is in the clouds and the trees and in the, you know, in the, the beauty of the mountains. That's pantheism. It's an ancient Greek <laughs> belief that also appeared in Eastern religions and is popular in New Age stuff. And yet it is not Christian or Jewish because God is distinctly separate from the created world in the Jew Judeo-Christian belief system. God is not the world. God made the world, and it's not the same thing. And so people who say, I believe in the God of the mountains and the trees, etc., that cannot be Christian. It is absolutely contrary to Christian faith. But in pantheism, you have a loss of distinction between God and the world. The world is God. Which therefore dispenses with the creation. There isn't any creation. It's all just God. You and me and the chairs and the camera and the whole thing. Since there is no longer a, a distinct creation as apart from God, it also removes any sense of God's providential activity within creation. If God is creation, God can't be acting in creation. Make sense? Pantheism and the New Age idea about it cannot be consistent with any belief in God, or any belief in any Judeo-Christian belief about God and God's providence. Now, particularly, modern theology, liberal theology, has tended to emphasize the eminence of God, that is, the closeness of God, the accessibility of God, to the exclusion of any sense of God's transcendence, of his otherness. That's where, when it all boils down to the idea of finding the God that is within you, there is no God within you. You are not God. You do not contain God. You are made in the image of God. There's a flicker of that image in you. But you are not God. And yet modern theology, which has been, you know, which has boiled down into new agey kind of stuff, says find the God with his in, with it, which is in you. And that's basically pantheism. You, a created being, are the same as God. And so therefore the whole providential thing doesn't work again. And, and, and that eminence, that idea that God can be so close to me, he's actually inside me. Now I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit now. Okay, that's a different thing. The indwelling of the Spirit is, a, is a, a different concept than what I'm talking about. But the idea that God somehow is in me, is so close to me, so imminent to me that he's actually inside me, he's part of me, removes the whole concept of God being wholly other. His ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. He is our Father, yes, but he's also in heaven, which we ain't. Okay? Becky? What about when people say, well, you say Christ lives in you. And I say, yes, I'm the Holy Spirit, Christ lives within me. Right. He was, he, when you accepted him by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit applies the sanctification that Jesus Christ made available to your life. The Holy Spirit is present in you. Yes. That's not the same as saying there is, you know, God is in me in the sense in which I, you know, I'm a little God. I've got my own, I've got my own deity. <laughs> All right? You know, I am, I am a... I have a deity inside of me. That's not the same as the Christian doctrine of the imparting of the Holy Spirit upon, upon belief and therefore the presence of Christ in your heart. Um, 
this, the idea of the pantheistic idea that God is so eminent to me, he actually is part of me, is not the same as saying the Holy Spirit, who is different than me, but came to dwell inside me, that's a different thing. Does that make sense? Well, I know, you know, people say, well, if you say, you know, when they argue with us, you know, they say, when well, you say Christ lives within me, yes, Christ lives within me. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get them to understand that. Yeah, well, you didn't start out there. You started out as a sinful, fallen right. creature who was completely apart from God. In fact, the Scripture says, the New Testament says, you were an enemy of God. That's not the same as the New Agey, pantheistic <laughs> idea that, you know, that I, I'm looking for the God that is naturally within me. The gift of, by faith in Jesus Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit coming in and indwelling us comes to us from outside as the divine entering us. It's not something that I have a natural possession of or claim to. Okay? Again, that's pantheism. You know, me and God are the same. Not so much. <laughs> Anybody who believes that has never really paid attention to themselves. And the fourth thing, which relates to the deism idea, the limiting of providence to only general providence. Just like you have a specific revelation, general revelation, you have specific providence and general providence. General providence means the administration of the world in only the most general ways through natural laws, which I've already talked about a little bit. Whereas spe special providence is God's concern with the details of history, the affairs of human life, and particular experiences, especially the experiences of the righteous, those who, who have chosen to follow him. Now, if you only believe in general providence, you better not try to pray, because it's not possible. Prayer only makes sense if you believe that God is actively involved in special uh, providence, that God is actively involved in the details of human life. If you're one of the people who has always said, well, you know, God created the natural order of things, and then when stuff happens, good stuff or bad stuff, it's just sort of the unfolding of God's plans. But he's not actively involved. There's no room for that in that for prayer. There's no room in that for asking God to assist you or to show you his will or anything else. Unless God is actively involved in the details, not just in the big general laws, forget the whole praying thing. Forget the whole beseeching of God. None of that works if you don't believe in special, detailed examples of providence. You see that? So if you don't believe, if, you believe, if you're one of the people who believe, well, there's just all these broad natural laws that God's created and all just unfolding, you can't pray. Are you willing to throw that out? Or do you see the need to change maybe the way you think about it? Yes, Suzanne. Is that like part of where God created them and he left it to just the law? Right? Exactly. This is sort of the, 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 the more specific detail of deism, which is God made it, created the natural laws, and then left. Well, deism, the idea that God left, is an example of, you know, created the natural order and the natural laws and then left. The deistic idea is general, rebel, uh, general uh, providence. But we believe, as Christians, God, is, God answers prayers. God sees every sparrow that falls. God knows the number of hairs on your head. I'm quoting scripture now. For some of us, that's easier than others. <laughs> <laughs> that can, though, none of those things can be true if God just created all the general natural laws and then left. And it all is just an unfolding. God cannot... Be, cannot say those things, cannot know those things, cannot answer prayers unless we believe that his providence involves an active involvement in the day-to-day -day affairs of human life. Right? Now, one more thing I'm going to say and then we'll take a break. The three aspects which I referred to other of the providence of God, and I think this will help you understand how provi what providence really is in terms of God and the universe. The first aspect of the providence of God, of the three, is the uh, aspect of preservation. Preservation, and, and uh, Grudem talks about these three in his book. The principle of providence by which God maintains the existence or the being of all of his creation. In other words, preservation means he doesn't let any of it go away. He makes sure it all still survives. Now, for those of you who have a science background, there's a very practical scientific expression of this, and that is the principle of the conservation of matter and energy. You all know what that means? 
Matter never goes away. The only thing that can happen is it may change its form. If you burn something, you don't really destroy it, you just turn it into gas and ashes. But it's still there. Energy never goes away. It may change its form, but all energy stays there. You can look up the laws, or the principles, they're usually called laws, of the conservation of matter and of the conservation of energy. No matter and no energy ever leaves. It's all still here, but it may change its form. That's a perfect illustration of the principle of providential preservation. Nothing that God has created is destroyed. He maintains the existence and being of all aspects of his creation, even though it may change form. It's all still here. Make sense? So that's the first aspect. He keeps it in existence. The second aspect is called concurrence or sometimes cooperation, which is the principle of providence by which God maintains the necessary actions of his creation. It's not just the existence, it's the actions of his creation. Again, a secular a principle here from physics is the principle of cause and effect. For every cause, there is an equal and opposite effect. Now, a very practical aspect of this, if any of you all are farmers, if I plant beans in my field and marigolds come up, I don't think you can eat marigolds, can you? Or something you can't eat. In other words, if the, if the cause and effect, if the actions, if the result of actions are not predictable, the world could not go forward. If you plant food crops and unedible things grow every time, I sometimes have said, if every time I flipped a switch on the wall and saw the lights coming off, a house blows up in San Juan Tacoma Law. And I didn't know if it was going to happen or not. Okay, is the lights going to come on this time or am I going to blow up a house? Would I ever throw that switch? No. So the principle of concurrence or cooperation is that God maintains necessary actions with his, in his creation. We can predict the results in a reliable way. If you didn't, you couldn't grow food. You couldn't do anything. You would sit paralyzed in your chair until you starved to death. But God has created a world in which he makes sure there is predictability. The necessary actions of his creation are knowable. Make sense? So things exist according to his rule, things act according to his rule. Preservation and concurrence. And the third aspect is government, which is the principle of providence by which God directs all of his creation to the ultimate fulfillment of his perfect will. Things are not random. Things do not happen entirely by chance. Nothing occurs outside God's will and God's plan. God does, is not sitting in heaven going, well, gosh, that didn't work. I'm going to have to try something else. <laughs> Everything that happens, whether we can understand how that's so or not, is a fulfillment of the will of the creator, the all-powerful creator who has an intention for everything. Although we may not always see it. He makes sure it keeps moving forward in the way he wants it to move forward. There is no power or authority that can de derail God's plans. So, preservation he keeps things existing or being. Concurrence, he maintains the necessary and predictable actions of his creation. And government, he maintains a direction that is in fulfillment of his will, ultimately. Again, even though we may not always understand that. Does that make sense? Alright, it's 2 o'clock. Let's take a 10 minute break. Alright, um, I want to turn now to scriptural support for the providence of God. In general, first, and then we'll get into some more questions. And I will come back toward the end of our time together today to talk about the, the part that people mostly have concerns about, and that is the issue of election and predestination. How God's providence relates to the issue of who gets saved. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be exhaustive about that today, maybe exhausting, but not exhaustive. I'm not going to cover all of those bases. We'll get back to this a little bit more when we talk about redemption um, a little bit later on, but we will touch on this today, okay? First, um, scriptural support for the providence of God. The primary, as I said earlier, the thing on which we base our beliefs is what does the scripture teach us? That's the ultimate authority. It trumps everything else. 
what, when we say we agree or don't agree with, with doctrine, especially historic doctrine of the church, we have to say, why do we or do we not agree with it? And the only possible reason for agreeing or not agreeing is what the scripture tells us. So let me go through some, some of these. I'm going to go, go pretty quickly just to give you some content. Again, there, this is nowhere near the whole sc scope of passages I could use, but it gives you an idea. Matthew 5.45, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. One of the things, as we go through these passages, I want you to notice, is that they are all present tense. It's not God made arrangements that his rain might fall on, but God causes, present tense, his rain to fall on. And that's true with virtually everything I'm going to tell you. Again, the idea that God is currently actively involved in the details, not just that he set it up so that it would happen later. Florette. The definition of evil, please. Evil? Uh, I don't know that I'm ready to define that right now. Let's wait till we get to that section, because okay. we will talk about that. Okay? Yeah. Um, second, um, Psalm 66. He rules, present tense, forever by his power, his eyes watch the nations, let not the rebellious rise up against him. Galatians 1, but when God who set me apart from my mother's womb, in other words, from the time I was in my mother's womb, he set me apart, and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might preach him amongst the Gentiles. Paul talking about himself, that God had planned, since he was a fetus in his mother, that this was going to be what the plan for him. Um, Luke 1, he has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Psalm 4, 8, In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Notice that all of these have to do with God being active now. There's more. Deuteronomy 33, let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for he shields him all day long. God is actively involved in protecting the righteous. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. For Samuel, and I also am very particular, I, again, I'm not using all of these, I try to select a wide variety, Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, uh, Prophets, History Books, um, from Psalm 107. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them. From their distress, he led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. He's actively involved in human endeavors. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. Psalm 145, the Lord upholds all who fall and lifts, lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Currently, you'll notice in the Lord's Prayer, we say, give us this day our daily bread, which means God is actively doing that every day. You know, he didn't sort of pile it up, and he tells us where to go find it when we need it. Matthew 10. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Some easier than others. <laughs> Acts 17. For in him we live and move and have our being. Talking about Jesus, and again Jesus in Colossians. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Those two passages, Acts 17 and Colossians 1.17, have to do with the fact that the presence of Jesus Christ, who was the one through whom creation occurred. Um, in the beginning was the uh, Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. He not only made it, but according to those two verses, he is actively involved with us, that we actually live and move and have our being in Him, and that in Him all things hold together. Without the presence of Christ, the Word, the second person of the Trinity, 
the bonds of matter would dissolve. Okay? That's pretty active governance. Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. 1 Peter 3.12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against all those who do evil. Again, if you only believe in the general laws, the natural laws that God created, and everything just sort of happens because of them, then you don't believe that God is attentive to our prayers. It doesn't work. Psalm 135.6, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. Psalm 139, 16, in your book were written, uh, were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. In other words, God planned it all before it happened. Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. In other words, what we think is chance, God is still controlling. Isaiah 46, 10, the, my purpose will be established, God speaks, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. There's the governance. Everything goes according to his ultimate plan. Acts 17, 26, God determined, all, uh, determined there, that is all the nations of the promised land, appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love God, implied as an active involvement now. Ephesians 1.11, God works all things after the counsel of His will. That governance theme again. Now, does the providence of God ordain evil? Meaning, evil being something which involves suffering, or grief, or pain, or the manifestation of something that we would interpret as being contrary to a good and loving God. Here's where it gets interesting. All right? All the rest, you got all the rest of that stuff, and you understand all of those passages I gave you, and that's not nearly all of them, indicate an active participation of God in his world today. Providence. Does God ordain evil? It's easy to say, as I said earlier, that God is involved in when we obey him, or when we do good stuff. But what about when we disobey him, or when we do evil stuff? Or what about the people who don't pay attention to him at all? The unregenerate. Genesis 50, 20. As for you, you meant... This is Joseph talking to his brothers. As for you, you meant evil against me. Remember they threw him in a pit and then sold him off into slavery to get rid of him because they were jealous? That was not a good thing to do. That was an evil act. And yet, Joseph says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. God used an undeniably evil act to bring about good. That, didn't, that doesn't mean the act was good. His brothers did not act in any good motivation or any good will. It was jealousy and spite and evil, and then they lied about it. Exodus 7 3, God says, But I will harden the heart, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that I may multiply my signs and wonders against Egypt. He says the same thing, that I will harden his heart. I will cause him not to let you go. And eventually that led to remember the death of all the firstborn, <laughs> along with all the other plagues. That's not only in Exodus 7.3, but he says the same thing in 4.21, 14.4, 14.8, God caused Pharaoh to say no, which led to some pretty horrible stuff. Deuteronomy 2.30, but Sihon king of Heshbon was not willing for us to pass through his land, for the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate to deliver him into your hand. God caused the king of Heshbon to not be generous toward the Israelites, which caused a war that killed people. And God did it on purpose. Joshua 11.20, for it was of the Lord to harden their, that is the people of the promised land's hearts, to meet Israel in battle in order that he might utterly destroy them that they might receive no mercy. God did that. Anybody who says the Bible is just selling a bill of goods about God, telling you all the stuff you want to hear, they're not paying attention. Judges 9.23, Then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. God sent an evil spirit. 
Judges 14.4, however, his father and mother did not know that it, that is Samson's sinful desire to marry a Philistine woman, contrary to the law, Samson broke the law, was of the Lord, for he was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. God ordained that his own law be broken. And that's not the only time. The other one, like uh, the evil spirit, you will remember that God also sent an evil spirit on, on uh, Saul, which made him angry toward David. 1 Samuel 2.25, But they, Eli's sons, would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. 1 Samuel 16.14, Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. There it is. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. God caused evil to raise up from the household. 2 Samuel 16, 11, Let him, Shammai, alone, and let him curse David, for the Lord has told him. God ordained that Shammai would curse David. And later on, that would have further negative consequences. 1 Samuel 22, 23, Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. 2 Kings 24, 19-20 He, Zedekiah, did evil in the sight of the Lord, for through the anger of the Lord this came about. 2 Chronicles 25, 20 But Amaziah would not listen, for it was from God, and he might deliver them into, that he might deliver them into the hand of Joash, because they had sought the gods of Edom. God caused him not to listen to good sense. Job 2.3, you, Satan, incited me, God, against him, Job, to ruin him without cause. It was Satan, God gave permission to Satan to do evil, to kill all of Job's children, to destroy his, his house, to uh, have his flocks taken by the Sabaeans and Chaldeans, and then later to give permission to Satan to cause him great pain and anguish with boils and all kinds of stuff. Get the idea here? The idea that God is only involved in the good stuff and the evil happens because just an unfolding stuff happens, but not because God intended it. Bob? I have a two part question. The first part is Is this saying that God is given every single thing that happens or only some things? And the second part is If God is pulling the strings behind every single thing, well, the second question, the answer to your first question is um, the difference in Calvinist and, and Arminian. The Calvinist view, based upon all of this, is that Scripture consistently says God is involved in all things, that nothing is outside His direct involvement and control. You may not like that, but that's what the Scripture says. I'm going to give you, I, I'm going to give you, and yet, in a minute particularly with regard to salvation. Okay. Now, the second part about, well, then does that mean nobody is responsible if God did it all? The answer to that is no, because it is still clear that people who, people still have, and this is a mystery. This is one of those places we have to say we don't know. There's a paradox here, how both of these things are true. All things are under God's control and with his involvement. And yet, the people that are also involved in that as second causes, do have some aspect of free will and therefore are held accountable for their decisions. The paradox. A paradox is not a contradiction. A paradox is something in which two things both are true. We don't understand how they both can be true, and yet they are. Well, this is one of the paradoxes of the Christian faith, the Judeo-Christian faith. God is in control of all things, and yet people do have volition to make decisions within God's will, and they are held accountable for those things. Right? I can decide whether or not I'm going to you know, commit murder. And yet nothing is outside God's control. Florette? Well, we're, we're just taking one little verse. I mean, that's all you're doing. It, it's, not, it's not taking the whole context of everything that's happening. We're not taking the context that there's the carnal mind that takes us away from the spiritual side of God. God said to the Israelites, do this, and I will protect you, I will keep you healthy, I will da-da-da-da-da. And they didn't follow, and they opened the door for all the carnal side to come in for all of the other aspects. Mm -hmm. That's what I need. That's not a clear enough definition of what evil is to me. 
to, you know. Um, well, see, I, I mean, we could look at much more context for these. My point is, I'm not giving you one verse. <laughs> I'm giving you 50, no, and I'm I could have given you 100. One within the context. I know, but um, what I'm giving you are clear statements where God willed for something to happen, even though it's something that by anybody's definition would be evil. You know, an evil spirit came upon someone. You know, God hardened their hearts and led to a war where people died. Um, now, the, the issue of small case evil in the context of a, of a large providence of a good and loving God who will do good ultimately, some of it has to do with the fact that a lot of the things that we consider evil that might even be described as evil by the, by the writers of Scripture, in the long run will result in good. I mean, that's the whole thing about Joseph and his brothers, what you meant for evil. And it was evil. What they did was evil. The carnal side of them took over, not the spiritual side. And Joseph had the spiritual side in him where the brothers didn't. They chose I, the carnal I don't know side. that that distinction is helpful. The carnal side is all the things that you want to do that's evil to other people. That's the... Okay, but the thing you're leaving out is we're talking about God's involvement in that. Not yeah. just their own decisions. But but all of these verses say God was doing it. It wrote that way. It also wrote that, that the Israelites started to define God as only their God, but God existed for all. Not only for them, they didn't have, there was, was there a, a different God for the Israelites versus anybody else in the world? Is there more than one God that that is over over all of us? I don't see where you're going with that with regard to this 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 issue, all right? Well, the, I'm the, saying that the book was written where the Israelites started to believe it was their God and not everybody's. But what does that have to do with you? Yeah, how does that relate to God's providence? The fact, and again, these verses are identifying God's active involvement in things, including things which were identified here and that we would identify, I think, clearly as evil. Because I'm just interpreting the fact that they saw things in, in the context of it being their own personal God. And it may, maybe they wrote it that way. Okay, I don't see the relationship there, but okay. let's go on, okay? okay. Uh, and I'm not trying to just shut you down. I'm, I'm, no, I'm sorry, I don't see the connection. There. Okay. I'm going to give you a number of more verses, and then we're going to talk about um, what it means, what this means. Job 20, 42, 11. And again, if I seem like I'm wearing this out with all these verses, it's because I need you to see that I'm not picking and choosing. I'm not just saying, here's five verses that prove what I want. But rather that this is comprehensive throughout Scripture. Scripture, and, and it was always believed until the 16th century. There is net nobody who seriously doubted that Scripture presents to us the idea of the providence of God over all things, whether good or evil. This has been a consistent belief in Christianity. So, Job 42.11, They consoled and comforted him with all the adversities that the Lord had brought on him. Psalm 105, 25, he, that is God, turned their, the Egyptians' hearts, to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord has made everything for its own pleasure, even the wicked for the day of evil. For its own purpose. Okay, he created the wicked for condemnation, is what this is saying. Isaiah 6.10, that's where you get into the sort of double predestination question. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. This is quoted in John as well. In other words, God intentionally made people so that they couldn't see and understand the truth. I am not making this up. Isaiah 63.17 why, O oh Lord, do you cause us to stray from your ways and harden our heart from fearing you? Jeremiah 6.21, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am laying stumbling blocks before this people. Lamentation 3.37.38, Who is there who speaks and it comes to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? it is, not, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill go forth? Ezekiel 38, 10 to 16. Thus says the Lord God, it comes about on that day that thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil plan. Amos 3, 6. If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? 
Acts 2.23, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. The greatest example of an evil being preordained and directed and fulfilled as part of the will of God was the betrayal and torture and torment and death of Jesus. And it was part of God's plan. He intended for it to happen. And, and it was evil. Yes, it resulted in the ultimate good. But the act itself was evil. Acts 4, 27 and 28. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. All of those people fulfilled God's will in what they did against Jesus. Romans 8, 19. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Election. He decides, not us. Um, Romans 11, 8. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, and ears to hear not, down to this very day. Romans 11.32, for God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. 2 Thessalonians 2.11, for this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. 1 Peter 2.8, they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom they were also appointed. Meaning they're fulfilling God's plan. All right. Does, does, that's not all the scripture we could have used, but I hope you get the point that there is a predominance of scriptural support that God is providentially directing in detail all of creation, including the things that we perceive of and that scripture identifies as being evil, whether we like it or not. And if you don't like it, why don't you like it? You need to, I'm serious in saying, ask yourself that question. Because it sure seems like scripture is making it clear. Right. There was a part that you started earlier that said that God knows all things. Instead of the fact that he destined them to happen, would he not know that they were going to happen rather than destining them to But that's not what the scripture says, Laura. And I've just given you 50 verses that said God did this, not thought about it, not knew it was going to happen. He did it actively, presently. Is that not true, everybody? Yes. Is, that what those, yes. is that not what those verses are saying? Yes. Okay. Again, it's... To, to step back and say, well, it's only that God knew those things were going to happen. That's not what the scripture says. And we may be very uncomfortable with that. But I can't change the fact that that's what the Bible says. And if that's my authority, that's what I have to lean on. Terry? Well, I, I read Bloom's stuff very carefully and I, I found it fascinating. But you're almost presenting it like you can't understand it. I mean, I get it. I don't know why the people don't, or, but it's clear. It's, it's, okay. it's not clear to everybody. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of churches that believe just the opposite. So it's not that is true. Yeah. Yeah. The Methodist Church is Arminian. They would not agree with what I've just been saying. Yeah. Uh, well, what, what, part of the Baptists. What I, my only point is this, that, and Grudem, Grudem does the same thing. He sets people up in opposition to each other as if they have to argue it, as if it was black and white. And it's not. Our minds maybe go that way, but we shouldn't let them. Well, and, and we do have to have humility. In fact, and I'm going to give you that in just a minute, having to do with election. Yeah, okay. I'm going to give you both sides of it. Yeah. And I think Grudem does a reasonable job of that. He presents the Armenian arguments from an Armenian perspective, and then he tells you why the Reform perspective doesn't agree with that. So I think he's very fair. What if there's four or five other ways of looking at it? We there really have, aren't. And we happen to only know of two at this point in time. Well, within all of Christendom, it's, it's really either or with regard to the providence of God. I mean, there really are only two ways of viewing it. That God is actively involved in all aspects and detail of maintaining and ordering and running, governing the universe, or that human beings have more authority than that in terms of through free will. Okay? I call that part. Yeah, and, and it may be that, you, that some people, if, if you see those as the two extremes, you know, they may edge a little bit more one way or the other, but it's not like there's a third path to follow in terms of this issue. 
Well, in, in my experience in human thinking, historically, it did tend to go with an either or. Our, folks like the Bono made millions of dollars by helping people realize that there's more than than uh, thinking along the spectrum. There's a lateral way of thinking of right. and, and well, appreciating them. And all, all I'm trying to say is that I, I didn't find it difficult to appreciate both views mm -hmm. uh, without necessarily saying, uh, although Bruno, of course, favors the one, right. uh, but he gave the other. But I, I'm just saying that maybe, maybe there's a bit of both that are possibly... Well, right. and I think there's a bit of both to the extent that we have to have some humility about it, that we don't have all the answers. Okay. Sure, okay. Sure. And that, that, to me, that's the third path, is saying, I believe this, but I'm not perfect. I haven't, I haven't figured it all out. I mean, I am a Reformed theologian. I'm a Calvinist, and yet I have to say, and, and it's because of what I read. And I'm gonna, again, I'm going to give you the other side when we talk about election in a minute, but that's that's where I'm coming from. But I have some humility about it and say, I haven't figured it all out. My wife disagrees with me. I don't hammer her on this and try to make her believe what I believe, because I, you know, I've got humility about it. Terry, yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> I've done I've done that before. I was just talking to Terry, and then I call you Terry. Sorry, Ken. Um. The hard part about this is this, because see, I was raised Armenian, just just the exact opposite, and as I've gotten older, um, I've become more Calvinist in my thinking. And the thing that, that has always been within me that's not wanted to accept this Calvinism is some there's something in me that tells me that if I accept this, then I am accepting a premise that God is unjust. And that's really not the case. Um, somehow we have to accept the fact that what may look or appear to our thinking to be unjust, uh, we have to be reminded that God's thoughts are higher than ours. His ways are higher than ours. And what, if we could understand everything about God, then He wouldn't be much of a God. And we have to accept there are things about Him that in our simplistic and moral or mortal minds, we're not going to be able to fully grasp. But we have to believe is that God is good, and in all this, He He desires for good to come about for mankind in the long run. And He's demonstrated His goodness and His love yes. for us. But and that's exactly where the humility comes in—the idea that that um, I'm not going to draw conclusions that take me to the negative because. I don't understand all of it, but I do have to deal with what's in front of me in terms of what Scripture says, and to be as honest with that as I can. You know, I I I'm, I don't think that if somebody decides that they believe the Arminian side is is better is more accurate to Scripture, and there are people of good faith to say that, I'm not going to condemn them for that. I'm not going to tell them they're idiots. I'm not going to say that they're not going to go to heaven or whatever. I mean, that's I I have found what I believe is truth based on Scripture, and they have done as well, and. If we all love Jesus, we're going to get to heaven, and one way or the other, we're going to be able to go neener neener to each other. Okay? Um, and I'm sure it's going to work both ways. So we do have to have humility, but the when we talk about the providence of God, we have to address these issues and have to say what the Scripture say about it. I want to get. I don't want to. Uh, uh, Mike, I'm going to take one more question because I do need to get to the rest of the stuff before the end of the time. Yes. What, what hits me about this is that the God ordains evil. But if a human being did the same thing, not being God, it would be sin, counted as sin in this regard. Is that right? In some cases, yes. Well, but it, you need to understand that the point of reference for all of the terms that we would use here is God. When you talk about justice, the definition of justice is founded in the nature of God. And so to say God would not be just... You've got, you know, you've got an epistemological problem there in terms of how can we perceive that if God Himself is the the essence of justice and of love and of rightness, that all things that are according to God's will are inherently the right things, even if we don't get that. Martin Luther, who was the strictest of monks in the strictest of monastic orders, feared constantly for his salvation. Until finally one day he said, you know, God is a perfect and righteous and loving God, if I do the best I can and He still decides to send me to hell, then that must be the right thing. At that moment, He found peace. And He never feared for His salvation again. Okay? That, we need to understand that, yes, we can ask those questions, and it's not wrong to ask those questions, 
But if we allow those questions to lead us to, to a, a skeptical cynicism that we eat our guts up inside because of it, then that's not the right direction because we've forgotten that the definition of sin is a violation of the will of God. I mean, any of the terms that you want to use, justice, love, sin, evil, etc., all of them, the point of reference for understanding what those things mean is in the perfection of God. And so we can't apply those things to him in the same way that we might apply them to ourselves or somebody else. We have to be careful. And at the very end, I'm going to give you some cautionary statements about how we proceed with this view. But let me, let me keep going here, okay? Having looked at these issues, the scriptures related to the providence of God ordaining evil, first, we need to see that scripture is quite consistent and shows, I think, beyond all doubt, that there are at least occasions on which God, in some real sense, ordains the evil choices of his creatures. God made these things to happen, or he made other people to make those choices. You cannot read the scriptures and not say that's true. I think I've just shown you that, right? Secondly, these evil actions do not happen outside of God's sovereign control, but in fact occur exactly because he has planned them. He causes them to happen. Furthermore, a pervasiveness of this pattern argues against these being merely isolated instances. It's not like, oh, well, this is an exception. It is more reasonable to take them as examples of the way God's sovereignty works, as implied by the more general scriptures referring to the unfolding of his sovereign path, uh, the plan, that again and again, God is actively involved unfolding his will in the world. And finally, therefore, God ordains everything to come to pass, including the evil as well as the good. Nothing falls outside his sovereign intent and control. He is actively involved. If you have heartburn with that, go back and read the scriptures and say, why am I having a problem with that? And you, it's all right, disagree with me. You're not going to fail the class or anything like that, but um, go to the Word, see what it says. Now, one aspect of the providence of God, the one that people have the most heartburn with, is the issue of predestination, or to use a better word, election. Those who are elect. We do talk about double predestination, which is hyper-Calvinism, which says that some are elected or predestined to salvation, and others are elected or predestined to damnation. You saw some of the passages that I just gave you that said that God willed you know, for the condemnation of some. That's what that is based on. Now, two passages which talk about this specifically. Romans 8, 29 and 30. By the way, this comes right after the passage that says, All things work together for the good of them who are um, for the, the good of them who are called according to God's purpose. Well, the called according to God's purpose, we usually quote that. That takes on a slightly different meaning when you read the next two verses, which are for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. The word that's translated predestined there doesn't just mean he knew about it in advance. It means he intended and caused it to happen. All right? And then Ephesians 1, 3 to 6. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Those are two very powerful verses from two of the most important books in the New Testament, Romans and Ephesians, saying God selected us before we were even born. From the, from the creation of the world, he decided who would be saved. And it ain't everybody. And yet, <laughs> Ezekiel 33.11, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked should turn from his way and live. 1 Timothy 2.4 God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3.9 The Lord is not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. What? 
this is where the mystery comes in. God is a good and loving God. He desires the best for everyone. And yet scripture tells us that he has chosen who will be saved. And it doesn't just say, and this is where, this is where Arminius sort of jumped the shark. It does not just say that God knew, knew what, in advance what people would decide. It says he predestined. He decided and then caused it to happen. Right? We can be uncomfortable with that. There is a mystery here. He is still a God who does not desire for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Which means we have a responsibility to, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with as many people as possible in the hope that they will come to saving faith, and ultimately it is up to God how he works that out. That's just the pragmatic place this, this comes to. And yet, we have to say what the scriptures say about God's predestiny, God being involved in every action, including actively involved in the decisions of people make. Now, the issue really comes down to free will and the nature of free will. Um, there are some who would say that, that the idea of God either directly or indi indirectly orchestrating things destroys any possibility of free will. And that for free will to be meaningful, there has to be some things that are outside God's sovereign control. That's a given. If free will means we really can't decide of ourselves, and it's by our authority and by our decision, then that means that there are some things that must be outside of God's control, in terms of sovereign control, in terms of entirely contingent on human choice. That's the extreme of the free will argument. But if God is not completely in control of all the contingencies, then how can he guarantee us our salvation? If we allow one thing that is outside God's omnipotent, sovereign involvement and control, where do we draw that line? He is either sovereign or he is not. He is either providentially in control or he is not. Any exception to that means there is something outside God's authority. And if there is anything outside God's authority, then the whole thing caves in. You see that? If God is not in control, if God is not sovereign, then he cannot be God as we understand him to be. That's process theology, by the way. Throw out another word for you. How many of you all ever read the book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People? Rabbi Kushner's book, when bad things happen to good people is, is the epitome of a statement of process theology, which was a popular theology in the last half of the 20th century. It's sort of died out now. It sort of was popular in the absence of anything else. Process theology says that even God is in process. He has not arrived yet. He is not perfect. He's doing the best he can. But bad stuff still happens because God can't really prevent everything. Well, then he's not God. Any exception to the sovereign authority and control of God in the world destroys the concept of God as we understand it. There really is no exception to that. It's not like we can say that God will say, well, talking to his, his creatures, well, I love you, and in spite of your disobedience, I certainly don't want to do anything that will be unpleasant, so we'll just forget about what I want, and you can do what you want. God doesn't work like that. He can't work like that and be God. He has to have all power, all knowledge, and all control. And Scripture says that involves his active involvement in the events of the world. Both the things we see as good and the things we see as evil. All things will ultimately lead to good. But I do not believe, whatever definition we have of free will, I do not believe that can supersede divine authority and divine providence. Because if that is so, then God is not God, we are God, because we have the trump card. If we can say, no, I'm going to decide different than what God wants, and God goes, well, okay, you can, then God is not God. Um, it destroys any sense of the divine. Now, a couple of uh, last things. Um, and this is consistent with the first passages I gave you, uh, the last passages, the and yet passages. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm being honest. It seems like two different messages. 
We can't reject either one. We can't say, well, I'm not going to listen to that part. This is the paradox. We have all these things in tension. But we can't allow it to take us to a place where we say God isn't ultimately in control. I get to decide. Calvin, who was so maligned and he was so great, Calvin <laughs> acknowledges in his Reformed theology that the Bible teaches, as I've shown you, that some are elect or predestined, but Calvin insisted that we can only be sure of our own salvation, that we can never judge whether or not someone else is saved. Hyper-Calvinism assumes that they can figure out whether you're saved. You're ugly, your mother dresses you funny, and God doesn't love you. <laughs> That's hyper-Calvinism. You're going down. Yes, you're going down. <laughs> you're toast. <laughs> the point of predestination, according to Calvin, is to remind us that God is free and gracious. He is free to do what He wishes, but He is gracious in His love and mercy to us. Nothing we do can earn God's favor. It is entirely from God that we receive salvation. Ultimately, the doctrine of election in Reformed theology is not a statement about people, it's a statement about the nature of God, that He is a good and loving God who is all-powerful and He decides. It is a statement about faith in God, not about condemnation for people. And Calvin would say, properly understood, the doctrine of predestination must be held in harmony with the doctrine of God's love for all humanity and His desire that all be saved. That's that paradox I've been talking about. It then frees us from the speculation of who is saved and who isn't, leaving us to rely wholly on God's divine wisdom and grace. God knows I don't. That's not my job. It's not your job. I am true to Scripture as it teaches me. And that's what we're trying to do here. As the Second Helvetic Confession puts it, and this all is supposed to be over there. Sorry. For the preaching of Christ, the Second Helvetic Confession is the Swiss confess Confession. For the preaching of Christ is to be heard, and it is to be believed, and it is to be held as beyond doubt, that if you believe and are in Christ, then you are elected. We don't need to fret about this. So some final thoughts on the providence of God. First, we have to be careful not to charge God himself with sin or evil in any firm form. James says God cannot... God you know, cannot be tempted and he does not tempt. God does not cause us to do evil. And I, before I have given the example of the difference between tempting and testing. God does test us. Testing means he gives us, you know, he strains our spiritual muscles in order to make them stronger because he wants us to succeed. When I give you all the tests in these classes, it's not because I want you to fail. It's because I want you to do better. I want you to learn this stuff. I want you to succeed. That's how God tests us. God does not tempt because tempting, which the devil does, is a desire for us to fail. The devil wants us to fail. God does not. So God does not tempt, although he does test. God does no evil per se. He, he sovereignly ordains evil to come to pass, but that does not mean that he is in any way himself evil. And that is a mystery. I'm not claiming we understand all this stuff. We just deal with it as it as it's presented to us. Second, we must be careful not to deny man's moral responsibility for his own choices. Just because God ultimately ordains what choice man ends up making doesn't mean man is absolved of moral responsibility. This is part of the paradox. God ultimately is responsible for what happens and where things go, but how that fits in with the fact that we still are responsible for our own decisions is part of the paradox. I hope you have a sense that I'm being honest with you about this stuff. I'm not trying to sell you anything here. Becky? So, is it that evil is just there and he allows or disallows? Or did he create evil? Or to be used in different ways in man? Or author or all of it? Or? God did not create evil. Evil came into the world when sin came into the world because of the betrayal of God's love and relationship by our ancient ancestors. God did create a world in which evil was possible because he created a world in which free choice could be negative, could be away from God, and evil came into the world, all right? Um, he, and yet, with the presence of evil in the world, God uses it. 
God does things which are identified by Scripture and that by, uh, by any human evaluation would have to be considered evil. Things that are not good, not just, not, you know, we would say that's not right. And yet God does use them. And the fact is, God doesn't hide the fact he uses them. He tells us over and over again in Scripture, which he, which he inspired, that this is how he sometimes works. And that's, that's what I wanted you, wanted you to clarify, because to everybody. Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's the way that's the way I see it. Mm -hmm. That's the okay. way I see it. And but I, I, I like the way you put it. Judy? Well, what good are earthquakes and tornadoes and the natural disaster? I mean, to I can't say that they're good. I mean, I, at least I can't say the good that comes from it. I, I don't know that no, we can't look at things like that and say what good's going to come out of it. Some of that is entirely within God's capability. And yet, you know, the, the passage I read, when disaster comes on the city, is it not God who ordained it? All right. Uh, and so there are aspects of that. Uh, and, and I've got one more point I want to make that's important, but, uh, but Ken? Well, when you look at the, the good and evil, you go back to Job. And Satan presented himself before Job and, and accused Job. And God simply, you know, God removed his protective hand because he, he removed that hedge of protection. And then Satan went forth and carried out the evil. Right. But he could not do it without permission. Right. Okay, I want to give you one more point because we're running out of time here. And this is an important one and a difficult one. I'm going to have to explain it. Finally, we must be careful not to represent God as being equally pleased with all that He sovereignly ordains in exactly the same way. Now, what that means is this has been explained in several ways, one of, in, a, in several different terms. One of them is God's revealed will and His sovereign will. This sort of helps us understand how God can use what appears to be an evil thing. That It's sort of like short-term, long-term. God's revealed will may be to do something. It may be a natural disaster. It may be, you know, blind, hardening somebody's heart. That the reveal, the immediately present expression of God's intention, not an accident, not something that happened because of the laws of nature, but because God intended it, that that revealed will in that specific instance may not be clear for us to understand because it may even be evil by any definition. And yet God's sovereign will, the bigger, the longer term thing, always will be to good. Ultimately, it will all be good. It will all be, that's the governance principle of providence, that it will all ultimately work toward God's intended end. And he is a good and righteous and loving God. And it will all end up there. And so the sense in which there are some things that are his revealed will or his short-term expression of providence that... Um, as this says, and I'm quoting Burkauer here, that it may not be that God is as pleased to have to, to, to use that short-term revealed will, which even means using evil, but that is an aspect to which he will achieve his longer-term sovereign will, which is for the always for the good. And we don't always understand. See, the problem is we don't see far enough, we don't see clearly enough, we don't understand well enough. To always be able to see how these things can work out in God's will. How could God be doing that? We're not smart enough to know all the time. And yet we know He is a good and loving God. He has demonstrated that even to the point of giving Him, you know, Himself, His own Son, for our sake. And it will work out in His sovereign will eventually. That's not pie in the sky by and by. It's an effort to try to practically understand how these things fit together. Okay, one last thing and then we have to close. Ken? Oh, well... Well, a very good more. example of what you're saying right there is Jesus, when he came uh, and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've sent all these prophets. I mean, he knew the destruction of Jerusalem was just around the corner. And he's basically warning that's what's going to happen right. to you now. And it was his heart breaking for them at that moment. Right. And, and God's revealed will was for his own son to be betrayed and beaten, tortured and tormented, to die a horrible death on the cross, unright unrighteously. There was no justice in that. That was his revealed will. His sovereign will was that that would create the opportunity for the salvation of all who would receive. Chris? Okay, I'm trying to understand this because I, I'm i not reformed, and I, but I've been studying this, okay. both sides. But, okay, God ordains evil. Does that equal God wills evil? Yes. Okay. The second thing is... At least at least in his revealed will. Right. He does not will evil long-term in his sovereign will. Right, okay. The other is 
is God then the first cause of evil? Or is it only man being the second cause is where it happens? God is the first cause of all things, and he manifests, he can manifest or ordain evil through the second causes. Again, in his revealed will, in his right. short-term will. But we have faith that the long-term sovereign will will be to the good. I mean, that's the description of heaven in Revelation, you know, etc. Okay, Bob first, and then Mike, and then we've got to go home. Bob. As to the question of tornadoes, the reason that there are tornadoes is that there are trailer parks. <laughs> Which are an abomination to God. So. <laughs> Mike? Well, it's here. To me, you know, Satan was a created being by God. Right. And, and the Jews firmly believe that Satan was created consciously with so that God would have an adversary. Not an eagle, but an adversary. But yes. an adversary. He's called the adversary by the Jews. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing is, is that the, the history of the Jews from the diaspora on uh, in persecution and all they've gone through, the, the Holocaust and the Holocaust, is, is the revealed will. And ultimately, they, they, they have an ultimate, ultimate important place in the, in the end time. Yeah. Well, and there's a, a, a wonderful story, and this may be a good illustration of the revealed will and suffering. Um, in the con one of the concentration camps, there were a number of rabbis that were there, and they got together to discuss whether or not God had committed an atrocity in allowing the Nazis to do the Jewish people what was happening right now. And after much discussion and consideration, and you know, consideration of what Scripture said, the decision of this group of rabbis was yes, God has committed an atrocity. And once that decision was made, the lead rabbi said, now let us go and pray. God wants us to be honest as we evaluate the things in the world, but ultimately we still fall back on the grace and love of God. Um, his revealed will, that historical event, and yet the recognition that there is more than that. That we don't always see or understand. Okay. You all have been troopers in this. This is a hard one. Okay. I've stretched you today, and you you survived. I haven't seen anybody pass out. So thank you. God bless you all. I will see you next week. Thank you.